the station bringing you tag for swag. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Dan Novak and Andrew Smith. John Russell teaches us a few phrasal verbs with the word fall for this week's Everyday Grammar Lesson. We close with the next part of our U.S. History series. But first, here is Dan Novak. Cotter is hosting the biggest sporting event in the world, the World Cup, next month. Visitors to the Gulf Arab country will have many places to stay, including hotels, camps, and large ships. But the cost of housing has greatly increased for those who live in Qatar. Many can no longer pay for their own places. Landlords are taking full advantage of the situation, and there's nothing in place to support the people who already live here, said Miriam. She is a 30-year-old British resident whose landlord did not renew her yearly contract in September. The landlord increased her monthly rent by four times, from about $1,370 to $5,490. Unable to pay for the increase, she had no choice but to move out. Residents in Qatar are mostly from other countries. They say the rising demand and shortage of rooms ahead of the World Cup have led landlords to charge more for rent. Sometimes they are raising rents by over 40% on very short notice, forcing residents to move. The Qatari government admitted there has been an increased demand for housing. It said residents who believe they have been wronged to bring the matter up with the government's rental disputes office. About 1.2 million fans are expected to arrive next month for the World Cup. Local officials say Qatar has set aside 130,000 rooms for visitors. They say the cost will start at around $80 a day. But it is not clear how many low-cost choices there are. A price limit applies to 80% of the rooms, the government said in a statement to the Associated Press. It did not answer questions about whether and how the limit has been put into effect. The price limit can go as high as $780 for places to stay. Many long-term residents say they are being driven out to make room for players, workers, and fans during the event. Some said landlords posted signs saying their buildings have been chosen by the government to host the 2022 World Cup guests and events, and they were ordered to leave ahead of the event. Omar al-Jaber is the director of housing at Qatar's Supreme Committee of Delivery and Legacy. He said the government played no part in contracts that ended for long-term residents. To be honest with you, we are not controlling what happens in the market, he told the AP. One woman said that when she signed her contract a year ago, her landlord promised he would not remove her during the World Cup. But just days before her contract was to be renewed, her landlord said he could not rent her the place for personal reasons. The next day, the room was listed on Airbnb for nearly $600 more a month than she had paid. You're kicking out long-term residents for a one-month event, she said. People are angry. It's very disruptive. Residents trying to find new homes because of the rent increases say it is nearly impossible to find places they can pay for. Most two-bedroom housings on the Pearl, a man-made island off the city of Doha, 
cost over $1,000 a night on Airbnb. The website also lists some places for $200,000 a month. The government is hoping the first World Cup in the Arab world will be a celebration for Qatari citizens and foreign residents. But residents say the housing problem shows the event comes at a cost. It's costing me a lot of stress and money, said a British teacher who had to leave his place after seven years. I'm having to pay for the World Cup. I'm Dan Novak. A NASA space instrument designed to study dust in the atmosphere and its effects on climate change is also detecting worldwide emissions of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. The device is called an imaging spectrometer. It has identified more than 50 methane super emitters in Central Asia the Middle East, and the southwestern United States, the space agency said recently. The newly measured methane hotspots include large oil and gas centers and waste dumps. The spectrometer was put in place on the International Space Station in July. NASA built the instrument mainly to identify the kinds of dust blown into the atmosphere from Earth's deserts and other dry areas. That study, NASA's Earth Surface Mineral Dust Investigation, or EMIT, will help scientists know if airborne dust in different parts of the world is likely to trap or deflect heat from the sun. This helps them know if the dust has a warming or cooling effect on the planet. It turns out that methane absorbs infrared light in a special way that emits spectrometer can easily detect, scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, near Los Angeles said. From the space station, EMIT can study large areas many kilometers wide while also centering on small areas the size of a football field. Some of the plumes EMIT detected are among the largest ever seen, unlike anything that has ever been observed from space, said Andrew Thorpe a JPL research technologist leading the methane studies. New images of methane super emitters shown by JPL included a group of 12 plumes from oil and gas structures in Turkmenistan. Some plumes were more than 32 kilometers wide. Scientists estimate the Turkmenistan plumes altogether emit methane at a rate of 50,400 kilograms per hour. This is close to the top emission rate from the 2015 Aliso Canyon gas field accident near Los Angeles. That event was one of the largest accidental methane releases in U.S. history. Two other large emitters were an oil field in New Mexico and a waste processing center in Iran, emitting nearly 29,000 kilograms of methane per hour combined. I'm Andrew Smith. The season when temperatures drop and leaves change color is also known as fall. Fall in the United States is a lively time. 
Seasonal vegetables, such as pumpkins and squash, appear on farms, in stores, and in popular dishes. Leaves on most trees turn from green to fiery red, bright orange, and golden yellow. In keeping with the lively, colorful spirit of fall, we will explore a lively, colorful area of connection between fall and grammar, phrasal verbs. Fall, a noun, also has a verb form. The verb form is more commonly used, Google's Ngram viewer suggests. The verb form often appears in phrasal verbs that have lively meanings. Such phrasal verbs add color to the landscape of English vocabulary. Phrasal verbs are groups of words that mean something different from what the individual words suggest. Phrasal verbs generally have a verb and one or two short words, such as in, up, behind, and so on. When we talk about phrasal verbs with fall, we mean that fall is acting as the main verb. One or more short words come after the verb fall to give it a special meaning. Let's start with a common example, fall into. Fall into has two common meanings. It can mean to be caught in a trap, either literally or figuratively. It can also mean to begin to do something or be affected by something without wanting or trying to. So, we might say the following sentences. The animal fell into the trap. Or, Joe answered the question before realizing he had fallen into a trap. We might also say, Joe fell into debt after his business failed. In all of these examples, the person or thing doing the action does not expect the result. A person or thing caught in a trap does not expect to end up in a trap, for example. Let's continue with another phrasal verb, fall for. It has two common varieties, fall for someone and fall for something. The difference in meaning comes after the phrasal verb. When you fall for someone, it means you start to feel strong desire and care for them. So you might say, I fell for David because he made me laugh a lot. Or, I fell for her the first time I saw her. But when you fall for something, you are fooled by something, such as a trick or joke. You might hear a person say, Joe agreed to Anna's idea? I can't believe he fell for that old trick. Such a statement about Joe is not kind. It is making fun of him. Let's take some time to work with these ideas. Listen to the following words and use the correct phrasal verb in the blanks. He blank blank bad behaviors. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here are a couple possible answers. He fell into bad behaviors. Or... He is falling into bad behaviors. The reason we chose fall into is because it means to begin to do something without wanting or trying to. You are saying that for whatever reason, the person is developing bad habits. Now let's try another example. Listen to the following words and use the correct phrasal verb in the blanks. As soon as their eyes made contact, they blank, blank each other. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here is one possible answer. As soon as their eyes made contact, they fell for each other. This means that two people had a romantic interest in each other as soon as they made eye contact. In today's report, we explored phrasal verbs that involve the verb fall. Like the colorful fall season, these phrasal verbs have colorful meanings. 
they are linked to ideas about unexpected results, traps, and even love. The next time you see a phrasal verb with fall, consider its meaning. Ask yourself how it connects to, or how it is different from, other phrasal verbs with fall. Perhaps one day you will say to yourself, I fell for that phrasal verb the first time I heard it. I'm John Russell. VOA Learning English. Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In 1823, President James Monroe introduced one of the most important foreign policy decisions in American history. It became known as the Monroe Doctrine. The doctrine said the United States never had and never would take part in any war between the European powers. At the same time, it warned the Europeans against interfering in the Western Hemisphere. Monroe declared that the Americas are not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. Historian Harlow Giles Unger says the Monroe Doctrine marked the end of the colonial era. The United States now considered the entire Western Hemisphere our sphere of influence, that we would keep out of their affairs, but they must keep out of our affairs. The United States continued to grow. New states joined the Union. Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama all became states before 1820. Louisiana had earlier become the first state to be formed from part of the Louisiana Territory that the United States bought from France. The rest of this huge area was called the Missouri Territory. By 1819, there were enough people in part of the Missouri Territory for that part to become the state of Missouri. But becoming a state required the approval of Congress. And historian Harlow Giles Unger says admitting Missouri would have changed the balance of power in the Senate. The Senate gave each state two votes. And... By convention, since the signing of the Constitution, the Senate was evenly divided between slave states and non-slave states. So the admission of Missouri would have added a slave state to the, uh, the Senate and left the northern non-slave states as a minority, and they were not going to accept this. Slaves were not new in America. Spain had brought them to the West Indies hundreds of years before. In 1619, a ship brought 20 African slaves to Jamestown, Virginia. These black men were sold to farmers. Over the years, the use of slaves spread to all the American colonies. However, there were many more slaves in the agricultural South than in the North. The farms in the North were smaller and needed less labor. But in the South, farms were much larger. Slaves were the least expensive form of labor. Most of the Northern states had passed laws before 1800 freeing slaves. Even the southern states made it illegal to import more slaves from Africa. But those southerners who already owned slaves believed they were necessary, and they refused to free them. 
Slavery had been legal when France and Spain controlled the Louisiana Territory. The United States did nothing to change this when it purchased the territory. So slavery was permitted in the Missouri Territory at the time Missouri asked for statehood. A New York congressman, James Talmadge, offered an amendment to Missouri's request to become a state. Talmadge proposed that no more slaves be brought into Missouri and that the children of slaves already there be freed at the age of 25. His proposal started a debate that lasted a year. Supporters of Talmadge argued that his proposed amendment was constitutional. The Constitution, they said, gave Congress the right to admit new states into the Union. This also meant, they said, that Congress could refuse to admit new states unless these states met conditions demanded by Congress. Supporters of the amendment also said small farmers of the North and East could not compete with the Southern farmers and the free labor of slaves. They argued that these Northern and Eastern farmers had as much right to the land of Missouri as anyone else. The Louisiana Territory had been paid for by the taxes of all Americans. Those opposed to slavery also argued that slaveholding states would be given too great a voice in the government if Missouri joined them. Under the Constitution, only three out of every five slaves were counted in the national population. The census, taken every ten years, is used to set the number of members for each state in the House of Representatives. In the House, unlike the Senate, the number of votes that a state has is based on its population. In the past, each time a slave state was admitted to the Union, a free state had also been admitted. Harlow Giles Unger explains what the supporters of the amendment may have been thinking. Uh, the problem basically was not so much a moral problem from their point of view. It was much moral as it was economic because the uh, northern states could not compete uh, with southern states. Northern states paid their labor by the peace. In the South, slave labor was free of charge. So the South had a tremendous economic advantage. They could produce goods at much lower cost than the North. And the advent of a majority in the Senate would have tilted the balance of power. Southerners had an answer for each argument of those supporting the Talmadge Amendment. They agreed that Congress had the constitutional right to admit or reject a state. But, they said, Congress did not have the right to make conditions for a territory to become a state. William Pinckney of Maryland argued that states already in the Union had joined without any conditions. If Congress, he declared, had the right to set conditions for new states, then these new states would not be equal to the old ones. The United States would no longer be a union of equal states. The debate was intense on both sides. The House of Representatives passed the Missouri bill with the Talmadge Amendment, but the Senate rejected it. The people of Missouri would try again for statehood when the new Congress met in 1820. By this time, another free state was ready to enter the Union. Maine, with the permission of Massachusetts, asked to become a separate state. The Senate joined the Maine Bill with the one for unconditional statehood for Missouri. 
Senators refused to separate the two, and so they continued to debate about conditions for statehood and slavery. Finally, Senator Jesse Thomas of Illinois offered a compromise. He said Maine could be admitted as a free state and Missouri as a state permitting slavery. But he said that no other state allowing slavery could be formed from the northern part of the Louisiana Territory. Many Southerners were not satisfied. The compromise closed the door against slavery entering large new areas of land. Southerners, like any other Americans, had a right to settle in the new territory. The Senate accepted Thomas's compromise. Congress approved statehood for both Missouri and Maine. Now President Monroe just needed to sign the bills. It was the spring of 1820. James Monroe was coming to the end of his first four years as president. He wanted to be elected again, but he faced a difficult decision about whether to allow the Missouri Compromise. President Monroe owned slaves. He understood the feelings of the South. His friends urged him to veto the Compromise Bill because it limited slavery in the territory. He also understood the strong feelings of those who opposed slavery. Monroe believed the Compromise was wrong, but not because it kept slaves out of the territory. The President did not believe the Constitution gave Congress the right to make such conditions. Monroe even wrote a veto message explaining why he could not approve the compromise, but in the end he did not use his veto. He believed there might be civil war if he rejected the compromise. So Monroe signed the bill. Missouri had permission to enter the Union as a slave state. The crisis seemed to end, but a few months later, a new problem developed. Missouri wrote a state constitution that it sent to Congress for approval. One part of this constitution did not permit free black men to enter the state. A number of lawmakers in Congress immediately opposed the state constitution. They said it violated the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution said citizens of each state had the same rights as citizens of each of the other states. And since free black men were citizens of some states, they should have the right to be citizens of Missouri. The debate lasted several months. Former House Speaker Henry Clay finally proposed a compromise that both sides accepted. Missouri could become a state if its legislature would make this promise. It would never pass any law that would violate the rights of any citizen of another state. This second compromise ended the dispute over slavery in Missouri and the Louisiana Territory. The Compromise Actions of 1820 settled the crisis of slavery for more than 20 years, but everyone knew that the settlement was only temporary. Former President Thomas Jefferson expressed his feelings with these words. This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed, indeed, for the moment. But this is a reprieve only, he said, not a final sentence. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. 